All right, we're recording 5.4. Today's lesson is uh, specifically for Josh, Mr. Josh Kelsey, which is a fictitious name, by the way, of a real student. Josh Kelsey. You don't know how to spell Kelsey. There's two E's in there. All right, sinusoids, sinusoids. What's the key word in sinusoids? Sign. Very good. Sign. So sinusoids are going to be the graphs, the functions of, of two of the six trig ratios that we have. And can you guess which two? Cosecant? That's a guess. What would you say? Sine would be a pretty obvious guess, right? Sinusoid. How would you come up with cosecant? Reciprocal. Yeah, it's a reciprocal of sine. Not a bad guess. So the graph of sinusoids could be sine, which is obvious, and it's reciprocal cosecant. Not a bad guess. Any Anybody else want to take a guess, like cotangent? Are these called cotangent usoids? No. Is there another trig function that has that same sound in it? Cosine. All right, we abbreviate it cos, but the function is cosine. It's spelled like this, co. Sine. So we have two functions that involve the word sine, and sinusoids are two functions. Do you think it's going to be sine and cosecant or sine and cosine? Just, just a guess. Sine and cosine, we have one vote. In a democracy, when only one person votes, that's the winner. All right, if you've turned 18, make sure you vote. Make sure you vote. Today is local elections. For all the uh, good stuff, right? The state representative and the and the sheriff. So if you're 18, make sure you vote. And I guess I'm talking to myself too, because <laughs> I'm 18. At least. <laughs> um, let's see. We're gonna go to Miss Vite. I won't tell you Riley's first name. She's gonna tell us which two it actually is, because she's had these before. Sinusoids are the graphs of sine and cosine. Yes, yes, yes. Sine and cosine. Very good. These guys here. So, Weston, that was a great guess on cosecant. It was a logical guess. But it turns out the sinusoids are the graphs of sine and cosine. Now, these are very important functions, and this is why we group them together. Let's go back to their definition. Sine of theta and cosine of theta on the unit circle in terms of x, y, and r. What was the definition of sine of theta? Y over r. You are getting on to the next one already, which is what? <laughs> x over r, right? Sine, y. Height. That's how you remember. Sine measures the height of your triangle. Cosine x width. That's how you remember that one, right? Um, these are very special ratios because they are the only two of the six ratios that have what in their denominator? Look at the screen for a hint. R, right? They are the only two that have R in the denominator. If you don't believe me, list them all out and look. They're the only two. What is R? in our unit circle, or just in general. It's the radius, right? And what do we know about the radius? It's always positive. If the radius is zero, you don't have a circle at all. You have what's called a, a dot, a degenerate circle. It's a point. And of course, R can't be negative in this case. So if R is always positive, we, we first of all know that the sine, S-I-G-N, of the sine and cosines is, is determined by the X and Y coordinate exclusively. That's kind of important. And here's something else that's worth making note of. If you drew a generic reference triangle right here, now let's make it a little bit bigger. There we go. R ends up being the what noose of our triangle? The hypotenuse, right? Very good. And what do you know in any triangle that actually exists? The relation between the hypotenuse and the other two sides. Size-wise. What, what do you know about the hypotenuse compared to the other two sides? It's, it's always larger. Yeah, if you actually have a triangle at all, um, R is going to be greater than X and R is going to be greater than Y. Now, we know that we have these quadrantal angles, right? Um, when Y is 0, we've collapsed the triangle down to the x-axis. And when x is 0, we've collapsed it down to the y-axis. But if there is a triangle at all to be had, r, the radius, is the hypotenuse in that reference triangle. And it's the hypotenuse, so it's bigger than both x and y. Now, that is important because what does that tell you then about the ratio of y to r and x to r? Yeah. 
If R is bigger than Y and R is bigger than X, flip it around. That means that Y is smaller than R and X is smaller than R. And if you have a ratio of a small number to a big number, what do you know about the value of that ratio? It's going to be less than 1. Yes. Very good. Now, because they can be negative, because they can be negative, we know that the absolute value is going to be less than 1. Because we can have negative y and negative x depending on where they live. And they're the only two ratios then that could, um, well, they're not the only two that could be less than 1, but they're always less than 1, we should say. Now, here's something else to consider. When we collapse the triangle down to the x-axis and the y-axis, of course, we know at the extremes what is, for instance, the sign of pi halves. Could be on your U positive 1, right? And what is cosine of pi? Well, pi is over there. So it would be negative 1, right? So when we collapse the triangle down, these become the absolute largest ratios they can be. So their absolute value is actually less than or equal to 1. But here's the upshot of that. You'll never have a sine ratio or a cosine ratio ever whose absolute value is bigger than 1. Because if you do, you're saying that the hypotenuse it's smaller than one of the shorter sides, right? And that's a pretty good math punchline, right? Did you hear about the hypotenuse that was shorter than the shorter side? No. <laughs> I need to work on my jokes. Right? That's funny because it doesn't happen. It can happen. Okay, one last thing we're going to talk about here. For what values of theta will we have a sine and a cosine ratio? That is, are the sine ratios and the cosine ratios ever D and E? You've had D and E as some of your answer choices, right, on your using the unit circle quizzes? When do we get D and E in our ratios, when the what's equal to zero, numerator or denominator? The denominator, right? For instance, tangent of pi halves. What's tangent of pi halves? D and E, because the ordered pair of pi halves is zero, one, and it's one over zero. So... You get D and E are undefined, a type of infinity, when the denominator is zero. Our denominator for the sine and cosine ratio is R. Is R ever equal to zero? No. So these are the only two functions, as I mentioned before, that have R in their denominator. So these are the only two trig functions that are continuous for all theta in the whole wide world in the set of real numbers, whether you're in degrees or radians. We have all the coterminal angles that are outside one rotation. There is no angle theta that exists that doesn't have a sine ratio or a cosine ratio associated with it. And believe it or not, it's, they're the only two that are that way, that are continuous for all theta, because all the other ratios have either an X or a Y in their denominator. And on the unit circle, on the coordinate plane, x can be 0 and y can be 0. Now, it's this important property of continuity, perhaps, that is the reason why we clump the sine and cosine functions together and collectively call them what? Sinusoids. Okay? So there you go. There's your brief introduction to the specialness of sine and cosine. They're also the ones that appear on the unit circle as the x and y coordinates. So they do kind of stand out in the very beginning. What you're going to notice also is from sine and cosine, you can express all the other four trig functions in terms of sine and cosine. And we've already been kind of doing that because we've been using the unit circle to generate the other four. So sine and cosine, very special, right? Who are the two most special trig functions of the six? Sine and cosine, right? And so we put them together in a family called the family of sinusoids, right? Okay, so here we go. Uh, we're going to sketch the graph of sine of theta. That is, we're going to take the ratios for the sines of these triangles that are formed on the unit circle, and we're going to plot them on the coordinate plane. So we're going to jump off the unit circle. It's like we're, we're unwinding the unit circle. So here's what we're going to do. Just like in Algebra 1, when we are trying to graph a function, let me go ahead and make the function f of theta is going to equal sine of theta. Okay, this is what we're looking at. What's our independent variable? Theta, theta right? You can rotate around to any theta, stop wherever you want, independently, your choice, and then you're going to have a triangle whose size depends upon that choice. So we're going to make a table of values, theta and sine of theta. 
just like in Algebra 1, we had x's and y's. And we're going to pick some values here. So this should be a good little review here. Let's use some nice, nice values of theta, like 0. Let's, let's stay in radian. So if I plug in a 0, what's f of 0? Well, it's sine of 0. What's sine of 0? Zero, right? Sine of zero is zero. Uh, let's rotate up to pi six. What's sine of pi six? Should be fast, right? One half. One half. Yep, good. Um, let's do pi thirds. What's sine of pi thirds? Square root of three over two, which is about point eight six. Just an FYI. And then we'll rotate up to pi halves. What's sine of pi halves? I have I skipped pi fourths. I went from pi six up to pi thirds, and now I'm straight up at 90. So pi halves would be one. So notice what's happening to your sine ratios as as on the unit circle we rotate through quadrant one from zero degrees to 90 degrees essentially. 0 0.5, 0 0.81. What's happening to your sine ratios? They're getting bigger, approaching one. Okay, and that makes sense because notice when we're on the x-axis. The height is zero, so the y value is zero, so the sine is zero, right? Remember? Height, y, sine. And as we rotate up to 90, your triangle's height is increasing, so the sine ratios are increasing. All right, let's go ahead and keep going. Let's start rotating now through quadrant two, and we'll keep going to the same angle. So what would be the pi thirds angle in quadrant two? What would be the angle, the pi thirds angle in quadrant two? This is reviewing the unit circle so kind of in liquid form. That's right, 2 pi thirds. Anyone say that? Oh. 2 pi thirds, huh? Yeah, so now what's sine of 2 pi thirds? Square root of 3 over 2. Man, we need to pop using the unit circle quiz tomorrow. You forgot it over the three-day break. Um, again, that's about 0.86. All right, the next angle we're going to hit is the pi 6 angle in quadrant 2. What's the pi 6 angle in quadrant 2? 5 pi 6, good. And what's sine of 5 pi 6? 1 half. And then we'll hit pi. What's sine of pi? 0. So notice again what's happened. As we rotated through quadrant 2 on the unit circle, sorry, our sine ratios now went from 1 to 0.86 to 0.5 back down to 0. So what's happening to the height of your triangle as you rotate back towards the x-axis? The height's decreasing. So basically, look at what the sine values did as we rotated halfway around the unit circle. I started at zero, I increased gradually up to one, and then my sine ratios decreased back down to, to zero from one. So that's a half rotation. We need to do another rotation. So let's do another column here. If you have room, keep your column going. And now we're going to rotate through quadrant three. And we'll hit the same angles just so we compare. So what would be the pi six angle in quadrant three? 7 pi 6. Now we're cooking with oil. Sine of 7 pi 6. Ooh, so close. Negative 1 half. Yeah, yeah, negative 1 half. And then we'll hit the pi thirds angle in quadrant 3. What is it? 4 pi thirds. Yes, sir. A sine of 4 pi thirds. Negative square root 3 over 2, which is about negative 0.86. And then we hit the next angle, which would be 3 pi halves. What's sine of 3 pi halves? Negative 1. So notice what's happening to your sine ratios. They are negative because we're in quadrant 3 where, where uh, the y value is negative. But they're going from 0 at pi to negative 1 half, negative point, or negative 0.5, negative 0.86, negative 1. Now they are decreasing, essentially. Their magnitudes are getting smaller. Uh, but the numbers themselves are decreasing also because they're becoming more negative uh, to a maximum or a minimum, I should say, of negative 1. And as we rotate now through quadrant 4, finishing up one rotation, after 3 pi halves, what would be the next angle we would hit? The pi thirds angle in quadrant 4? Well, first we, we rotate through 5 pi thirds. And what's sine of 5 pi thirds? Negative square root 3 over 2, which again is negative 0.86. And then we'll hit the 11 pi 6, which is negative 1 half. And then we come around full circle, literally, to 2 pi. And sine of 2 pi is 0. Now, we did skip the pi fourths angle. If you wanted to have those extra points in there, you can be more accurate on your graph. But notice one last thing here as we rotate from quadrant four. We go now from a minimum of negative one, and the magnitudes and the values are now increasing gradually back up to zero. And if you notice the symmetry, 
all the ratio values end up being the same. Now, if I were to go around a second rotation and stop at all those curved terminal angles to the ones that I have here, what would the sine ratios be at each of the coterminal angles? The same, right? Because coterminal angles have the exact same trig ratios. So if I could do it for one rotation from 0 to 2 pi, I can then transfer that to any other rotation. So let's go ahead and plot those points. We basically have a set of ordered pairs, x comma y, that we created right here, x comma y. And we can plot them on the coordinate plane. So we need an x and y axis. So here's my y-axis, and there's my x-axis. We'll make it kind of long. All right, let's plot the points. Uh, what flavor should we use for sine? Pick a good flavor. Blue flavor. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. We're going to plot the point. So the first point is 0, 0, also known as the origin. There it is, the origin. The next point is pi. Six, one half. Oops. Well, here we go. We probably need to set the table before we eat, don't we? Let's do something real quickly here. Let's come over here just arbitrarily and call that 2 pi. That's one rotation. So now I can fit my values from the y-axis to 2 pi. Are you okay with that? Now that we have 2 pi arbitrarily drawn, just look at the distance from the, the y-axis to 2 pi and cut it in half, bisect it on your iPad, and we call that what? pi. Okay. Let's do it one more time. Look at the distance on your iPad between 0 and pi. Bisect it on your iPad and call it what? Pi halves. Good. Now the distance between pi and 2 pi you could bisect, and you're counting by pi halves now, right? These are your quadrantal angles. So 1 pi halves, that's 2 pi halves. The next one would be 3 pi halves. Yeah. And then 4 pi halves is 2 pi, and if you needed more, 5 pi halves, so on and so forth, you can keep going. That allows us to kind of put our marks down in relation to the quadrantal angles. Okay, so let's do that. The next point would be pi 6 comma 1 half. Well, let's do one last thing before we put our points on here. We know that it's going to hit a high point of 1 and a low point of negative 1. So let's go ahead and label the y-axis. That's what I mean by setting the table. We've got our x-axis and our y-axis all set up, and now all we have to do is plot points. All right, so back to blue. Pi 6 comma, one-half. So pi 6 is going to be really, really close to the um, axis. It might be somewhere right there. But notice, even though I'm closer to zero, I'm not quite halfway to pi halves yet, I am already halfway up vertically. See that? As I venture out just by 30 degrees, which is a third of the way to pi halves, my y values have already increased halfway to one. All right, the next one would be pi thirds comma 0.86. So that would be the next mark. This would be pi thirds here. I'm not going to label it. But now it's going to be somewhere about right there. And then at pi halves, it actually equals 1. Now, the, the beauty of plotting these points is you know, as we've already said, sine and cosine exist through a continuum. There, there are other sine and cosine values that are off the unit circle that exist in between these. You can infer what they're going to look like just by plotting the points. You can actually connect the dots, and that's the last thing we're going to do here. Okay, rotating past pi halves, we had 2 pi thirds. 2 pi thirds is going to be equidistance off of pi halves from this other mark, and it's 0.86 again, so it has the exact same elevation as this one over here. And then we're at 5 pi 6, which is 1 half, so it's going to be right there. And then at pi, we were back down to 0. So notice you can see the symmetry there already between 0 and pi. The y values go from 0, they increase up to a max of 1, and then they decrease at the exact same rate back down to 0. If you wanted to get more accurate, you could plot more points. Okay, now let's go into uh, the third quadrant. We're going to have um, 7 pi 6, which is going to be about right there, and we're at negative 1 half. So again, we're rotating... 30 degrees past pi, a third of the way towards 3 pi halves, but we're already halfway down to the, to the min. All right, the next value over here is going to be at uh, <clears throat> 4 pi thirds, and it's negative 0.86, so about right here. And then at 3 pi halves, we're back down at 1. And then we continue to rotate. We're at 5 pi thirds, and we're at negative 0.86, bless you. 11 pi six, we're at negative 1 half. 
and 2 pi, we're back down to 0. Okay, that's fun, isn't it? You did that in algebra 1. You now have an idea of what the function sine of x looks like, where theta is mapped on your x-axis in radians, and sine of theta, the ratios, the unitless ratios, are graphed on the y-axis. Now, this is what's important. When we use radians, of course, the x-axis has units of what? Radians. What are the units of radians? There are no units, okay? And on the y-axis, when we plot the actual sine ratios, the units for the sine ratios are what? None, because you're taking the ratio of two side lengths. So it's feet to feet, meters to meters, and they divide out. So you have an x and y axis that has no units on the x or y axis, which means if you can describe real world behavior um, or you have real world behavior that kind of models this type of pattern, you can fit a curve, an equation to it and describe and predict what it's doing. And that's what we're going to do in the next section. But for now, here's what we want to do. And some of you have already done it. We're going to connect the dots. Okay. And if we connect the dots, it's going to look like this to a high point of one. And then we're going to come down. And then we're going to come down down here to the 3 pi halves, and we're going to finish up here. Okay, so notice you have these values here at 0, 0, pi halves, comma, 1, pi, comma, 0, 3 pi halves, negative 1, and 2 pi, 0. Those are probably the most important ordered pairs on this graph. Those were the quadrantal angles, right? If you then memorize where these points are, you can kind of infer what's happening in between here. This is what I call one cycle of the graph of sine of theta. And why do I call it one cycle? Well, if I were to draw another cycle from 2 pi to 4 pi, and again, stopped at the same place, what would the graph look like? The same. Now, here's what's cool with notability. I can actually copy and paste and just kind of add it on right there and now change my values down here. You can actually create like a stamp. If this were an assembly line and the x-axis were going by, you could create a stamp that looked like the red graph from 0 to 2 pi, and every 2 pi you can just come by and go stamp, 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 and you get the same thing. Okay, it goes on forever. We would just have to relabel these um, points. Let's go ahead and do that. What would be the next point where it was high? Well, good question. Notice I only labeled the quadrantal angles to begin with. If this from 0 to 2 pi is considered one cycle, then these pi halves, pi, 3 pi halves, and 2 pi are your quarter cycle intervals, right? Quarter cycle, not motorcycle, quarter cycle. So from 0 to 2 pi, that's a quarter of a cycle. Pi halves to pi, pi to 3 pi halves, 3 pi halves to 2 pi halves, or 2 pi. These are going to be called what I call your critical values. Your critical values are your high points, your low points, and then you have these points here, which I'm going to say are your axis points. So H for high points, A for axis points, and L for low points. And if you know where those high, your axis, and low points are, and if you know what the X values are, you can continue generating the graph on down the line. Let's see what that would look like. Let's just count by our quarter cycle counting interval, which is pi halves. That's one pi halves, two pi halves, three pi halves, four pi halves, right? So the next one would be what? Five pi halves would be the next high point. We're back down on the axis. That would be six pi halves. What does six pi halves simplify to? Three pi. The next one here at the low point would be seven pi halves. And, of course, the next one that's off the screen would be 8 pi halves, and 8 pi halves simplifies to 4 pi, which would be two full rotations. I could even continue that process over here off to the left, right? Let's keep going in the other direction, erasing all those. Let's still count by, that's 0 now, not 2 pi. Okay, let's count to the left now. We're on the axis. If we go left, our next critical value is the low point. We're still counting by pi halves, so it would be 
negative pi halves, negative 1 pi halves. That would be negative 2 pi halves, which is negative pi. The next one would be a high point, which would be negative 3 pi halves. And the next one would be negative 4 pi halves, which is negative 2 pi. And we can continue this process indefinitely, going out to the right as far as we want and going out to the left as far as we want. Y'all seen a graph like that before? In your science class? What have y'all studied like that? Y'all might call these waves, wave functions. And you, you measure the wavelength, right? You measure the wavelength from crest to crest or trough to trough, right? And sound waves can be modeled using these types of things. There's lots of things that could be modeled. Waves themselves can be modeled using this type of function. We're not going to call um, the wavelength wavelength. We're going to call it the period, okay, the period. This is first period, right? And we meet every day at the same time. So the period that we're going to define is essentially going to be what you all call the wavelength. So it's going to be the length of one cycle. I don't call them waves. I call them cycles. But that's the same thing, just different terminology. <clears throat> Basically, it's going to be the smallest distance of theta for which the graph repeats itself. So the period of our function here is what? How often does this thing repeat itself? 2 pi, very good. Now we know that 2 pi is reasonable because that's once around the unit circle. And as soon as you get into that second rotation or third rotation, if you stop at the same place, those angles are going to be what with these angles? Coterminal, and coterminal angles have the same ratio. Okay, so this is a magnificent function because it is smooth and continuous everywhere. It has a lot of symmetry. Every one of these is symmetrical through the high point and low point. You can fold it on the high point and low point, and it lines up with itself. This function also has a particular type of symmetry. Is it even, odd, or neither? Does it have origin symmetry or y-axis symmetry? Origin symmetry. Okay, notice if you hold your finger down at the origin and turn your iPad upside down, you'll get the exact same graph. And because it has origin symmetry, we know it's a what function? It's an odd function. Okay, and so what that means then is that sine of negative theta equals negative sine of positive theta. That's the upshot of an odd function, if you remember. Plugging in a negative input gives you the opposite of plugging in a positive input. And we can verify that very quickly. Let's look at what sine of negative pi halves is. It's negative 1. That's the opposite of sine of positive pi halves, which is positive 1. Yeah. So opposite thetas have opposite y values. Okay, so this is going to become a parent function that you have to memorize. All right, and here's another version of it down here without everything being marked. What is the domain of this function? Let's talk about domain. All real numbers. And by real numbers, we're talking about angles, right? All real angles. And what's the range of sine? Negative 1 to 1. Negative 1 to 1. It's crest to trough. The lowest y value is negative 1. The highest y value is positive 1. And, of course, if you ever have a sine ratio outside of that interval, you're saying the hypotenuse is not the longest side, which it is. So it's an odd function. The domain is all real numbers. The range is negative 1 to 1, and you can see it passes the vertical line test. All right, now there's got to be a way to help you remember that, okay? Because if you know what one cycle looks like and you have your critical values memorized, you can continue that indefinitely. So I give sine of theta a new name, and here's the name I give to sine of theta. Maybe you've heard people talking about her in the hallways. Her name is Sahala. So when I say Sahala, you... Holla back. No, maybe not. All right. What does Sahala mean? It's the name of the sine function. I went to school with someone named Kahala. Don't get her confused with Sahala. Okay. What the heck is Sahala? Well, let me show you. Guess what the sign or the S in Sahala stands for? I'm really bad at clues. Sine. The S in Sahala means we're talking about the sine function. And then guess what these letters are? To sketch one cycle of sine, let's come back up here. Yeah. To sketch one cycle 
of complete a four symmetrical cycles, you need five critical values. So for Sahala, for sine, we're starting on the axis at zero, zero, and then we go high, axis, low, axis. That's one cycle. If you want to see it down here where it's not cluttered, one cycle starts on the axis, then it's high, and then it's back to the axis, and then it's low, and one cycle finishes again on the axis. That's what those are. Those are your critical values. So for sine, for one cycle, you need axis high, axis low, axis. Sahala. Think you can remember Sahala? It's your new parent function, Sahala. Is it different for cosine? Yes, it's different for cosine. We don't want to call cosine Kahala just like I don't want to call you Joseph. Right? Now, Sahala and cosine, whatever its name are going to be, they're going to be in the same family like you and your brother, but they do have different names. Okay? They look similar, like y'all look similar, right? They look very similar, like y'all look similar. And if I gave Sahala the test for cosine, Sahala would take it home and keep it in a safe place for cosine until cosine was ready for it. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to have time to meet cosine today and give it a name because we're running out of time. How, much, how many minutes? I forgot my watch today. Nine, we have nine minutes? Okay. I think we might have a chance to do it. Um, let's jump down here. Here's Sahala. Okay, and, and again, it's, uh, it's shown there. The period is 2 pi. That's the length of one cycle, it, the wavelength. You don't have to measure it from high to high necessarily. You can measure it from an axis point to an axis point, but you have to make sure that you're measuring it from the axis point to the next axis point that has the same behavior. So we're starting at the axis point that's going up to the next axis point. That's not a full cycle because it's going down, so you'd have to come all the way over here to 2 pi where it's back on the axis going up. So you can measure the wavelength of the period from any point to its next coterminal. Like if you started right there, you're at that point going up. The next point over here that's coterminal with it would be that one. And how far apart are those two points? 2 pi. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, here's the standard transformation form. Because we're not just going to be sketching Sahala all the time. Once we have a new parent function, we're going to be looking at transformations of it. So we talked about standard transformation form earlier in the year. Here it is specifically for sine of x. So going through there very quickly, anytime you have a function that has an a multiplied in front, what is that going to do to the graph, regardless of what the function is? When you all speak at once, I can't hear anybody. Vertical, Vertical uh, uh, stretch or compression by a factor of Either A or 1 over A. Yeah, it's going to be your vertical dilation factor. Uh, the B, which is on the inside, is going to be multiplied. It's your horizontal stretch or compression. And then your C, which is on the inside affecting the graph horizontally, that's going to be your horizontal what? shift. And then your plus D is going to be your vertical shift. Yeah. So all of the same things that we studied before with other functions are going to apply to the sine function and eventually the cosine function. But we have a specific nomenclature for the sine transformations. What does nomenclature mean? We, they, we have our own vocabulary. There's, there's a unique lexicon that's, that's prescribed to these sine functions. Okay? There's, there's some mathematical jargon that if you're in math circles and people are talking about this, you can, can follow, all right? How much time do we have now? Seven minutes. God, we have plenty of time. Okay. Um, here's the, here's the, uh, the lexicon. The A in the front is still going to be the vertical dilation factor, but if I take the absolute value of it, because it could be negative, it still would reflect it across the x-axis, we're going to call it the amplitude of the sine wave. The amplitude. So if you come over here, if you were to multiply that function by, let's say, 3, what it would do is it would make the graph 3 times taller. Okay? You're taking the graph and you're stretching it by a factor of 3. So instead of going up to 1, it's now going to go up to 3, and it's going to go all the way down to negative 3. You're stretching the graph vertically. So it's still your vertical dilation factor, but we're calling it the amplitude. So your amplitude is now going to be 3. That's the absolute value of A. Now, think about amplitude. When you're talking about sound waves, you probably know the word amplitude already, right? 
The amplitude is the wave height. Okay? And by wave height, we don't mean all the way from high to low. We mean from the center axis, okay, which we're actually going to call the sinusoidal axis. It's that middle line that runs through there. It's the x-axis for plain old sine. So the wave height is the distance from the sinusoidal axis, the A value, to either the high or the low. Now, if you have a sound wave, what do you think increasing the amplitude does to the sound? It makes it more intense, which means it makes it louder. Right. So if you increase the amplitude of a sound wave, you don't change the pitch, the note itself. You just change its intensity. You change its... Uh, decibel level and it's easy to remember that because they have these machines that when you plug into them they make the sound louder they're called what amplitudifiers right they're called amplitudifiers or what for short amps right they're called amps but amps is short for what amplitudifiers yeah they started out as amplitudifiers and then people were like that's that's too long so then they just call them amplifiers and then someone just said amps right and pretty soon they're just going to be called a's I'm guessing, if the trend goes. But they're really called what? Amplitudifiers. Amplitudifiers. Nice. But it's still your vertical dilation factor. How much time do we have, Weston? Four minutes. Okay, sweet. <clears throat> B. Let's do B. The absolute value of B. <clears throat> B is still going to be your horizontal dilation factor, right? It's going to stretch it or compress it horizontally like an accordion. Alex Meissner's coming pretty soon, isn't he, to... Brontex? I don't know who that is. The worst vest guy? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it is going to be a horizontal dilation factor, but it has a very particular meaning for sinusoid. B itself, the one that's visible in the equation, becomes the number of cycles or the number of full waves in a 2 pi distance. Okay? For example, if I were to look at sine of 2x, what would be my B value? 2. What's that going to do to any graph if you multiply X by 2? Horizontally compress it by a factor of 2. So the X value at 2 pi is now going to be at pi. And it's going to look like this. Because I compressed it by a factor of 2, how many cycles do I now see where I used to see 1? 2. Well, I used to see 1 from 0 to 2 pi because that's the definition. So B is the number of cycles from 0 to 2 pi. And because B is 2, I see 2 cycles. Now, that is not the frequency. In science class, you talk about the frequency. The frequency is a little bit different because B tells you the number of cycles in a 2 pi distance, and the frequency tells you the distance per cycle. So how would those be related? The frequency... Actually, the frequency is the B value. I'm getting it backwards. The frequency does tell you the number of cycles per distance. If you look at it and you see how many times the wave goes by in a prescribed distance, that's the frequency. So the absolute value B is your frequency, and it's the reciprocal of the period, which is kind of good to know. The period is the length of one cycle. So you're actually measuring how long it takes to make one full cycle. That's the period. The frequency does a little bit different. It says, now I'm going to establish a predetermined amount of time, and I'm just going to count how many full cycles I have in that prescribed amount of time. So the period and the frequency, or the wavelength and the frequency, are what? Reciprocals. You might have had this equation in your science class. F equals 1 over lambda. Lambda is your wavelength. We're, we're mathematicians, not scientists, so we use a different letter. We use P for period, but the wavelength and the period are the same. We'll both use F for frequency. I think we can agree on that. Okay, um, we'll stop right there, and we'll pick up with what C is tomorrow. So we got amplitude, and we have period, and the number of cycles in 2 pi, our sinusoidal graph. Then we're going to start sketching them, and then the next section we start applying them. Don't forget to turn in your calculator.